Good afternoon. I'm Tom Putnam, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum, and on behalf of Tom McNaught and all of my library and foundation colleagues, I thank you for coming and acknowledge the generous underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forum's lead sponsor, Bank of America, Raytheon, Boston Capital, the Lowell Institute, represented here today by Bill Lowell, the Boston Foundation, and our media partners, the Boston Globe, Xfinity, and WBUR. We're privileged to have here with us today not just one, but two former Supreme Court justices. So first, let me thank and acknowledge our primary speaker, Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens. You honor us, sir, with your presence. And second, let me recognize his friend who traveled from his home in New Hampshire to be with us for this special occasion, Justice David Souter. I was struck in reading Justice Stevens' memoir, Five Justices, that the biggest concern expressed during his Senate confirmation hearing in 1975 was the state of his health. Since at the age, <laughs> since at the age of 55, he had recently had heart surgery. He went on, of course, to be the third longest serving Supreme Court Justice, retiring 35 years ago at the age of 90. 35 years later at the age of 90. <laughs> When naming, him, when naming him to the court, President Ford stated that he chose Justice Stevens as, quote, the finest legal mind I could find. And not only has his mind remained agile, but is he in such good physical shape that only a few years ago, when throwing out the first pitch at a Cubs game at Wrigley Field, he got the ball right across the plate. Though he did admit at lunch that during his daily swim in the ocean in Florida this winter, he did on occasion need help from a neighbor when walking back to the beach through the surf. So while we are mostly here to learn about your judicial insights, Justice Stevens, we confess to being equally intrigued to know your secrets for healthy living. It is fitting in this setting to also note a concern raised by Senator Ted Kennedy during the confirmation hearings, who asked if there was anything in Justice Stevens's record that would indicate whether he would be fair to claims asserted, asserted on behalf of underprivileged citizens, those who the senator described as having submerged aspirations. And in response, Justice Stevens referenced one of the most important opinions he had written as a circuit judge, which upheld a prisoner's right to a hearing before parole could be revoked, as well as personal letters of support from inmates who appreciated his decision. To suffice it, suffice it to say, he won easy confirmation with a final vote tally of 98 to 0. We will hear more this afternoon about Justice Stevenson's term on our nation's highest court, where he was known for his plain spoken style and a vision of American justice propelled by common sense and moral clarity. Our moderator this afternoon is David Barron, the S. William Green Professor of Public Law at Harvard Law School, the former Acting Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Legal Counsel and President Obama's Justice Department, and a former law clerk to John Paul Stevens. We'll be taking written questions today, so our staff will be going around uh, with index cards. Please write your question down, and we'll bring them up to David. I'd also like to recognize colleagues who are here with us today from Mount Vernon, including its president, Kurt V. Bronze. On display in our museum for the next few weeks is George Washington's personal copy of the United States Constitution and Bill of Rights with his handwritten annotations. I hope you all have a chance to see it. Throughout his career on the Supreme Court, Justice John Paul Stevens was known not only for the many opinions he wrote when in the majority, but also for his strong belief in the importance of dissent. If you disagree, he once wrote, you should say so. In fact, he holds the record for the most dissents written by a single justice, a whopping 720. <laughs> Allow me to conclude with three brief examples. Noting how much the court had changed during his tenure, he wrote a dissent in a case striking down race-based enrollment policies in public schools, stating, quote, it is my firm conviction that no member of the court that I joined in 1975 would have agreed with today's decision. In what has been described as a barnstorming dissent of the Citizens United case, 
he offered the following wry observation. While American democracy is imperfect, few outside the majority of this court would have thought its flaws included a dearth of corporate money and politics. And he concluded his dissent on the Bush v. Gore ruling that ended the dispute over the Florida recount with these words. Although we may never know with complete certainty the identity of the winner of this year's presidential election, the identity of the loser is perfectly clear. It is the nation's confidence in the judge as an impartial guardian of the rule of law. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me now in welcoming to the Kennedy Library David Barron and one of the most impartial guardians of the rule of law in our nation's history, the Honorable John Paul Stevens. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the Kennedy Library. This is a great uh, honor for me, uh, having worked for the Justice uh, and having been subjected to many questions by him. I now get to ask a few uh, <laughs> to my former boss. Um, I want to start uh, at the very beginning. And some of it comes out of uh, the book that Tom mentioned, which is Five Chiefs, uh, that the justice wrote. I was joking to my wife that since you've retired, I think you've written more than I have. Um, <laughs> and I get paid to do this. So, uh, But I want to, before getting to the book, talk a little bit about how you got onto the court and the confirmation uh, process. As Tom mentioned, it was a 98 to nothing vote. Um, but the whole process sounds so different to read about it, uh, how it worked then uh, than how it works uh, today. H how did you first get into the mix of uh, being uh, nominated? When did you learn that you were being considered? Well, I, <clears throat> I guess I learned that I was being considered when uh, after Justice Douglas resigned uh, I, I guess I got a call, phone call from Bob Sprecher, who was my colleague on the Court of Appeals, who said uh, he was all excited about the fact somebody called him to ask questions about me, and, and for some, had some relationship to the vacancy. I don't remember exactly what it was, but anyway, Bob Sprecher was the first one that uh, brought the matter to my attention. Then you were uh, nominated in 1975 by President Ford. Correct. And did you have an interview with President Ford before that, or how did that come about? No, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, I first met uh, President Ford at a dinner at the White House about 10 days before uh, he made the decision. And it was a, a large dinner it was attended by a number of federal judges and, and their, their wives and some other, other dignitaries. But there was no formal interview either with the president or with the attorney general. And at that uh, dinner, he came over and, and joined us at our table for about 15 or 20 minutes. We had a nice conversation. He, he was talking about the uh, financial crisis in New York City at the time. And I can still remember being impressed about two things about it. He was You immediately liked him. He was a very likable man. And secondly, you also recognized he was a very intelligent man and he was a good lawyer. He, he talked about uh, the diff different negotiations that were going on over the financial crisis and it was clear to me that he had a clear grasp of what was going on both sides of the issue and so forth. And I can still remember being very uh, impressed with him both because I liked him and because I saw uh, this guy's really a good lawyer. So then after that dinner, I guess he liked you too. Uh, because well. <laughs> uh, he then nominated you to the Supreme Court. And that process uh, also, to read about in the book, sounds so different than what a confirmation process is uh, today. Did the White House or the Department of Justice help you prepare for those hearings, or how did that work? Uh, the answer is no, they didn't. They, they did uh, two things for me. Uh, one, they arranged meetings with the senators to, to, for interviews before the hearing started. I spent a whole day on, at, at the Capitol going from one office to the other. And that was because a, a, a couple of years before, the uh, Senate had rejected the confirm, had refused to confirm uh, Judge Hainsworth of the Fourth Circuit, who was really a, a qualified candidate. But Judge Hainsworth was uh, 
there was a question raised about whether or not he should have participated in some court of appeals decision. And he, he had gone ahead and said. And during the questioning of him, during the hearings themselves, the, the senators got an unfavorable impression of him because he had a speech defect. And he didn't, the senators did not realize that. They thought of him as not being candid in his responses. And so after that event, the Senate decided that before the hearings would start, they would have informal meetings between the nominee and the senators in their offices just on a one-to-one on -one basis so that they get acquainted and that, that kind of mistake would not happen again. And I have to say, that was a really an enjoyable part of the process because I met most of the United States senators who, in a personal way, they, they've been elected in important elections. They're all, all pretty nice guys. And I particularly remember my meeting with uh, Barry Goldwater, who was a, also a particularly nice guy. He had flown every aircraft in the military and was, I won't say he was a nut about flying, but he was very much interested in aviation. And when he learned that I had my own single engine airplane, I was in. <laughs> <laughs> I had his folks. But that was the kind of meeting uh, that we had for the most part. Now, there was one other thing which I thought was interesting also in the same vein about how different the confirmation process was. You had a meeting with Strom Thurmond. Yes, I did. Uh, at the time, the main issue that was uh, the, before the court was the constitutionality of capital punishment. A couple of years earlier, the court had uh, decided the Furman case, and people were speculating about how, how I might vote on that issue. And I didn't really know. I had, uh, I had no strong feelings one way or the other about it, and I was leery about being asked uh, about that issue. But when I met uh, Senator Thurman, I shook hands with everybody in his office. There must have been 100 people in the office, I can remember. But anyway, at the end of our, our, our greeting, he said, Judge Stevens, I'd like you to come back to my office. I want to talk to you. But, and I thought to myself, oh, here it comes. He's going to ask me about the death penalty. And we went back into his office and so sat down. And he said, Judge Stevens, I want to talk to you about the death penalty. I'm not going to ask you how you feel about it, because that would be highly improper. But I want to tell you how I feel about it. <laughs> and then he made a, a strong statement of why he thought it was a proper uh, enforcement tool. But I thought it interesting how he, he thought it, it, it proper not to be pressing a, a, a nominee about views on issues that would be coming before the court. And then you say at the end of those confirmation hearings, I think to get out of uh, oh. the area. Well, one of the things the Department just did for us, they, um, my former law partner, Edward Rothschild, who was one of the best lawyers in Chicago for many, many years, he, he it was, was my lawyer and friend and a counselor during the hearings. He came to all the hearings. And the Department of Justice sent a chauffeured vehicle to pick us up in the morning and take us to the hearings every day. But the last day of the hearings, we had to get a cab to get home. <laughs> So how, do you, you have now watched 30, 40 years of the confirmation process for judges uh, developing since that time. It's obviously become a very, very different thing. Your confirmation hearing was two years after Roe, and I think not a single question about Roe was asked That's correct. at the confirmation hearing. So what's your assessment of what's happened? Well, I'll have to refer to my good friend David Souter to answer that question. There was no television during my hearings. But when I was watching the hearings about David a, t a few years later, the hearings began with statements by the senators about how important the hearings were. And they took up um, <laughs> all morning, all afternoon. When, uh, when my hearings started, the attorney general talked for maybe half a minute. The senate, two senators from Illinois said they were Favored, in favor of the nomination, and the head of the American Bar Association Committee on the Judiciary spoke. That took about 30 seconds for all four of them to say, <laughs> and then they started questioning. Now, the fact that their the hearings are televised has had, obviously has had a significant impact on what goes on at the hearings. So I, I was going to save this question for later, but it's relevant, but I also think I can guess the answer. What do you think of televising Supreme Court arguments? 
Well, the, the answer, I don't feel as strongly about it as I know David is. And I, and we, one of the reasons for not doing it is we might have lost him earlier than we did. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, there are two sides to it. On the one hand, it's clear that it would be desirable for the public to have a better understanding of the court because I think the members of the public would be very favorably impressed if they could see an oral argument and actually see that the justices are fully prepared, know what the issues are about, and are engaged in trying to figure out what to do. So it, it, their televising would perform an educational function, which would be a, a strong positive. On the other hand, just as it's true of the confirmation hearings, when you introduce television into an, an, an ev event that it has not been present before, you don't know what might happen. It might have an adverse effect on the, on the deliberations. I can't be sure, but there have been cases when high visibility cases when the lawyers basically argued to the press rather than arguing to the justices. I remember one abortion case, for example, in which it, uh, I won't say the lawyers ignored the court, but they were, were more interested in the public reaction that they could uh, uh, generate than they were in the argument. And I think there's a serious danger that the quality of the court's deliberations might be adversely affected by introducing television. So I think on balance that they are wise not to, not to change something when you're not sure what the consequences of the change might be. So now I don't know if everyone knows this, but the justice um, connection to the court goes back much further than the 30 years that you uh, served on it because you started as a law clerk yes. uh, on the court to Justice uh, Wiley Rutledge. Correct. And we were talking uh, before uh, these proceedings began uh, about the odd circumstances that led you to ending up with Justice Rutledge, which was that it was the consequence of a coin toss. That's right. That's right. So how, how did that come about? Well, there was another, uh, uh, I graduated from Northwestern Law School, and there were two of us in the class who had better grades than most of the students did. And we were, we were pretty close in our, our scholarship, and we also happened to be good friends. And this man was Art Cedar, who later practiced in Chicago and Detroit, and is now uh, retired in Virginia. But uh, the Willard Wirtz, who was on the faculty and later became uh, Secretary of Labor in the cabinet, and Willard Pedrick, who later became uh, Dean of one of the law schools out, out in, in the West, both had uh, pretty certain, uh, uh, com not commitments, but they were quite sure that they could be successful in getting its clerkships. One would be with the uh, Chief Justice uh, Vinson, and the other would be with Wiley Rutledge. But the, the Vinson clerkship wouldn't begin until the year, a year ahead, and whereas the Rutledge clerkship was for right away. And they decided to let us decide which, which to, to take. We both felt like we were senior citizens. We'd been, we were three or four years older than normal law school graduates because we'd gone through World War II. But anyway, we, they let us make the choice. We couldn't agree, so we had to flip a coin. And I won the coin flip, and I got to, to, to clerk with Rutledge right away. So that brings me to the book, because the other justice that you uh, could have chosen but didn't was Chief Justice uh, Vincent. Correct. And he's the first of the chiefs that you describe uh, in your memoir of the five chiefs that you've had occasion uh, to work with. And um, one who uh, stands out was the chief you first served under, and that's uh, Warren Berger. And you um, are quite favorably uh, impressed uh, by many aspects of Chief Justice Berger's uh, uh, tenure, but one aspect that you talk about is how he ran conference uh, and the way he ran it relative to the way other chiefs uh, you've worked with uh, have run uh, conference. Could you tell us a little bit about that and just give us a sense, what is conference? How does it work? Well, <laughs> this could be a long speech and I'll try not <laughs> to do that to you. But there are conferences uh, that just deal with certiorari, well, not, that's not right. Friday, the Friday conference is first you deal with your cert petition and then you dis, uh, decide the merits of cases that have been argued that week. You also have a conference on Wednesday that week to decide the cases that were argued 
on, on Monday of the week. For, on, on Wednesday you decide the Monday cases, Friday you decide the Tuesday and Wednesday cases. And Chief Justice Berger was not the best presiding officer imaginable in the conference. He tended to explain how he felt about the case. Then he tended on occasion to interrupt others and th th uh, add something he forgot to mention before and so forth. And he sort of vacillated back and forth and sometimes had not clearly made up his own mind on how he would vote in the particular case. But he was not a good presiding officer. Whereas his successor, Bill Rehnquist and John Roberts, were just the opposite. They both were excellent presiding officers, very orderly, thoroughly prepared about the cases and, and led the discussion very impartially. And now what happens at that conference? So do you debate the issue or is it each justice sort of says their position, casts their vote, and then we tally up and see who had the most votes? Or how, how does it work? Well, the way it works now, talk about the last two, is that the justices speak in order of seniority, explaining first, normally, for example, uh, John Roberts will explain what the issues are in the case in a succinct way. He does it very, very capable and very impartially. And then he sets forth his own views about how the case should be decided. And then they, you go around the table in order of seniority and, and you cast your vote after explaining uh, what your thoughts are. This, I might say, is different from, from the practice that obtained many, many years earlier when I was a law clerk. Then they went down the table discussing the case, but nobody voted until the junior justice, and then they voted in reverse order of seniority. And I've, I always thought was that, that was the better way to do it, because even if it's just a tentative vote in conference, once you've taken a position, there's a sort of a tendency to stick to that position. Whereas if nobody's voted at all, it's, a, it's a more of an open, open forum. And it's interesting, I sat next to Bill Rehnquist in those days, and he had also been a law clerk before, as you know, and he, he shared my view of that time. We raised it two or three times without any success. But after he became chief, his views changed. <laughs> <laughs> and he liked the idea that he spoke first. But and how much debate or opportunity is there for debate and discussion among the justices about a case? Well, uh, the, the, there's, no, there's no time limit in conference. Every, every justice has the opportunity to speak as, as long as he or she wants to. It's, it's unlike, the, uh, unlike the arguments. But in most of the cases, the first time the justices have ex exchanged views about a case is during the oral arguments. When they're asking questions, they might try to make a point that they think the lawyers have not made or something like that. But, uh, but then the first time they really discuss it uh, in, a, in a deliberative way is during the conference. And could you say why that is? I mean, why not, you know, a case comes in, it's an interesting case, the healthcare case or the gay marriages case. They're so huge in their potential importance. Aren't you tempted to walk into other people's offices and debate it or discuss well, it? Or is there a reason why they, you wait till the... No, that happens from time to time. Mm -hmm. And on important cases, you might feel very strong about it and want to talk to someone about the case. But generally speaking, all of the justices are so busy, they need the time to think through the cases for themselves and try to think out what, what position to take and so that they generally are happy to wait till the conference itself before they share views. But I'm sure there are individual cases where there's a departure from that uh, routine. Let me talk a little bit about how you go about actually writing an opinion. So um, you always wrote the first draft of the opinion and you always made a point of writing out the facts yes. uh, of the case. Uh, and it was always a little startling as a law clerk to walk into your office and you had all the books up on your desk and you were busy trying to piece together the facts of before you would let a law clerk uh, see the draft of the opinion. That's normally true, yeah. Why, why is that? Why did you think that was such an important thing for you to take charge of? Well, again, there's a historical answer to it. Uh, that's what Wiley Rutledge did. He wrote everything out on a yellow pad in his own handwriting. And normally, it, the, his first draft would be what was printed later. 
there would often be a footnote to say something like JPS gets sites or something <laughs> like that, and we'd have to draft footnotes or something. But he wrote it out, wrote them out himself, and, and uh, I thought that was a good practice. And he tended to write longer opinions than, than many justices did. But there are a lot of reasons for it. I don't want to take too much time on this, but uh, he felt that the, the losing lawyer was entitled to know that his argument had been understood before it was rejected. And he always thought it was quite important to, give, to, to have an opinion that, that, that demonstrated to the reader that the, the issues had been thoroughly considered and, and rejected. And uh, so he tended to write, uh, to write long. So anyway, and that plus the fact that I'd, I'd had some experience uh, in the Court of Appeals with uh, uh, Judge John Hastings, who always wrote out his opinion. I remember he told me shortly after I went in the Court of Appeals, if you write out the facts carefully and thoroughly, the case will usually decide itself. And it's true with this. When you're working with the facts, the facts can be really terribly important in the, in the outcome of the case. The point you just made about how important you thought it is for each uh, lawyer before the court, or each uh, party before the court, to have the views considered by the individual uh, justice just reminds me of something when I was clerking that you said that has always stayed with me, that it's a court, but you also thought I'm a judge, an individual judge okay. still uh, on that court, which I think explains in part why you dissented. Uh, as often as you did in the sense that you felt if a judge on the court or justice on the court had a view of the case, everyone was entitled to know that justice's view and that that was more important perhaps than the whole court being on the same page. Is that fair or am I getting it wrong? No, no, that's fair. It, uh, plus, if, uh, then there's another historical explanation for that. It goes way, way back, but uh, before I became a judge, I participated in some hearings involving an allegation of impropriety against members of the Illinois Supreme Court. And the, the, I was just surprised during those hearings when we went through the papers of the judge to find that the two best judges on the court had dissented from the case which was being uh, investigated but had not published their, their dissents. I remember thinking at that time, well, the public is entitled to know that. And that stuck with me over the years, and I, I came to the conclusion that if one dissents from a case, it's dissenting from a case, that's part of the decisional process, and the public really ought to know that. And uh, so I decided early that one of the questions that uh, seminars on newly appointed appellate judges consider is whether when to dissent and when not to dissent because there's a, also a, a, the contrary view is that the, the court should try and portray the law as a, as a seamless web in which everything uh, fits, out, fits together when it really doesn't. And, <laughs> and so I, I just thought it, it's part of the uh, obligation of a judge would really be to tell, tell your own views about a case even if they differ from, from the majority. So we have some questions from all of you that I want to get to, but I want to ask you about three cases uh, that uh, Tom made some reference uh, to, at least two of them. But the first one is, is a case that's very recent, and that's the health care uh, case. And it's on an issue I know that you care uh, deeply about, which is the federalism issues and the scope of uh, national power. A lot of people were surprised, if not by the outcome of the case, by the lineup of the case. Uh, that the Chief Justice had joined the four uh, more liberal members of the court uh, to uphold the Health Care Act. What was your reaction? Were you surprised by how it came out? Or? No, no, I really wasn't. And I, I very seldom brag about my ability to predict outcomes because I'm notoriously <laughs> wrong most of the time. But just so happens, and I m mentioned this the other day, uh, that uh, uh, my law clerk, uh, Adina Mishra, who, who was with me at the morning of the ha cases were handed down, and I talked about the case, it was, and we knew what it was the end of the term, so we knew the case wouldn't have come down that day. And I happened to uh, be in the courtroom, I won't, won't explain why, and I said to her, I think that the, the government's gonna win five to four, and the reason is the Chief Justice is gonna, gonna vote in favor of the, 
the, uh, the government. And the reason, as, as I, I did not anticipate his particular reasoning in the opinion, but I have complete confidence in his intellectual integrity. And I think he was totally convinced. I mean, I, I thought the law was going to compel that result, and I thought he was going to follow the law. And he did. And I, 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 it was my appraisal of John Roberts that persuaded me to make that prediction. Uh -huh. And I was right. Yes, you <laughs> certainly were. Now, another case, I guess, in which you and the Chief Justice disagreed uh, was the Citizens United uh, case. Right. And you disagreed quite strongly with it. But I don't know if everyone knows the history. When you first came onto the court, the very first campaign finance, a big campaign finance case, was being decided by the court that very year, which was Buckley versus Vallejo. That's the case that sort of equated money uh, with speech. You couldn't participate in the case That's right. uh, at the time, so you just saw the drafts uh, floating around. And you said that the drafts were enough to give you a long-lasting distaste <laughs> for this whole line of jurisprudence. Uh, Citizens United has obviously attracted an enormous amount of controversy uh, in its wake. Where do you think it fundamentally went wrong? And what do you think is likely to happen? Uh, in the future. There's a lot of talk about maybe a constitutional amendment to correct it. Do you think that would be a wise idea? Well, it took me 90 pages, was it, to <laughs> explain, explain my views in my dissent. And I, I have not changed my views about, about the merits of the case or the issue generally. But I'm not sure that the, the basic error that th goes through that case and that line of jurisprudence doesn't go all the way back to Buckley against Vallejo in which they, uh, up, they uh, held unconstitutional limitations on expenditures. And I think that was the basic mistake that not, should not have been made. It does seem to me that there's a sentence in the Buckley opinion that's quoted over and over again about how you can't uh, handicap one side of a debate by, uh, by you can't uh, give an advantage to one side of the debate by putting a handicap on the other side, which makes complete sense under most issues other than campaign issues. But in certain situations, it's important to limit the, the opportunities of both sides to speak. An example is oral arguments before the Supreme Court. We put limits on how much you can speak, both in, in, in writing and orally. And it seems to me that that as long as the limits are reasonable and sufficient to permit adequate exposition of ideas, that the, the legislature should be able to, to, put, to limit the total amount of speech devoted to uh, in campaigns in, in election. So it's not merely the fact that the corporate speech was uh, permitted or was encouraged by that, but the very, the very a basic point about whether there, sh there should be some limits on the total speed, and I think there should be. And now, there's a part of my question you didn't answer, which you may have chosen not to answer, but I'll come back to it, which is you recently wrote a book review in the New York Review of Books, and I don't know if any of you have had a chance to read uh, some of Justice Stevens' uh, reviews, but they're really wonderful uh, essays uh, online. One of them was on a book, I think, called Framed, uh, about the oh, need to change the, uh, the Irving Morris yes book. The, the need to change uh, some of the constitutional provisions that are outdated or outmoded, and and it raised the issue of whether the constitution we have now is good enough, right, or or should there be uh, improvements uh, on it? And in that connection, there really has been a lot of talk around campaign finance and whether the court's uh, ruling uh, makes it necessary to amend the constitution. Do you have thoughts about that? I'm not sure how that's connected to the review on frame, but that's all right. <laughs> yes, yes, I do. I, I, I think it would be, it would be uh, the public would benefit from an amendment that authorized legislatures to put, uh, put limits on the amount of money that could be expended in campaigns. They should not be too low because there is a danger that incumbents have an advantage by, by their fact they're in office. So, so they have to be reasonable, but you don't have to allow this, this uh, tremendous amount of to spend on repetitive commercials over and over again, which are not re making arguments that are particularly persuasive. But I, I, do, I do think that a, a constitutional amendment would be desirable. So the, um, 
last case I want to ask you uh, about before getting to questions uh, relates to the gay marriage cases and the Defense of Marriage Act, which I know is before the court. Uh, at present, I guess we'll hear about it in a, a month or so. But um, those cases come to the court with traces of your own influence uh, because the earliest uh, version uh, of disputes over gay rights uh, at the court was obviously Bowers versus Hardwood. Correct. But that case began to crumble uh, a bit in a case called Romer versus Evans, which was a Colorado case. And you were serving uh, not as the chief justice, but as the senior associate justice uh, at the time, which gave you the power to assign I the opinion forget. when the chief justice uh, was not in the majority. And you chose to give that uh, opinion to Justice Kennedy, uh, who wrote the opinion in Romer, and then went on to write the opinion, relying on Romer, that overruled uh, Bowers uh, versus Hardwick, which is the, the Lawrence case. Um, How did you decide to choose Justice Kennedy for that decision? I, I really can't remember with any, any particularity. I just, as I did with every assignment I had to make, uh, I thought he'd do a good job with the opinion, and he did. I mean, that's <laughs> about, about all I can say about that. And now a case uh, like this, as momentous a case as the gay marriages cases uh, could be, uh, a case that also figures in the public imagination uh, in the same way uh, in terms of the spotlight that goes on the court was Bush versus uh, Gore. Uh, two things about that that I want to um, uh, ask you about. The first is whether you saw it coming. In other words, uh, as all the controversy is going on, you're watching on television, they're counting the chads. Um, I can interrupt you there and say Justice Scalia saw it coming. He, he mentioned it in several of And at the time he mentioned it, I thought, I, I thought that's not before us now and not, not apt to be before us for a long time. So I did not see it coming. And then you were at a Christmas party, I guess, the night before with Justice Breyer where there was some discussion. Oh, you're talking, I thought you were talking about the gay rights. No, 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 the, no, no, the Bush versus Gore. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. What was the question again? We, we, in, <laughs> in Bush versus Gore, did you see that that was gonna come to the court and that the court would get involved in it, or was that a surprise to you that the court? Well, uh, there was a, uh, a, an application for a stay that was followed and the court had to act on the application for a stay and uh, I think both, uh, I saw Stephen at the uh, Christmas party at the Mellon Art Gallery, which they have a party for, for uh, uh, it, well, before, before Christmas. And uh, we talked briefly about it and we both thought there's nothing to it. And uh, we we're, both were sort of surprised that the chief had even called a conference for the next day. So uh, I, I was surprised at the chief's decision to ask for a conference the next day, and I was even more surprised at the results of the conference. But I'm, I'm not sure I... You, get that, you, you got it right. That's what I was asking. Oh, just okay. to, yeah. uh, and in the wake of that case, there was a lot of concern, as you expressed potentially in your dissent, in that case about what it would do to the reputation uh, of the court, and I know some people may have seen Justice O'Connor recently uh, said that she had second thoughts or was at least questioned whether it was wise for the court to have gotten uh, involved in, in that case. Well, let me just correct one slight difference between what you, the way you phrased the question and what I said in my dissent. I was concerned about the impact of the decision on the rule of law as articulated by judges, because I thought it tended to create the impression in the public that non-judicial factors might have voted, motivated, the, motivated the decision of the Florida Supreme Court. And I thought it was quite unfair to create the impression that they might have acted in a way that was not char characteristic uh, of the judicial office. And I really think that I had in mind uh, the, what I consider the improper impression that that decision created about the rule of law generally, which included the actions of the Florida court as well as our own court. And I, 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 it's very important to me to remember that it wasn't just our court, but mm -hmm. the Florida court, and, and, and I thought at the time 
that this was a decision, given the fact that they were essentially pa passing on uh, what the Florida uh, statutes meant and so forth, that, in which we should have uh, shown more deference to the uh, state Supreme Court. Mr. Chief Justice, I want to get to questions uh, that you've uh, submitted to us, um, and I want to make sure that uh, we get to them. So let me uh, start. Some, I think, are probably from students uh, that we have here, and then some uh, from people who are not students. Um, so here's a question that I will enjoy asking, uh, but I know the answer to it. Do law clerks ever write decisions? Do, ever write Do decisions? law clerks ever write the decisions? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not in my chambers, but they do. <laughs> You've heard of the practice elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. Okay, here's a question which I bet you will dispute the premise of, um, and it concerns affirmative action. And the question is, why has your stance on affirmative action changed over your years on the court? Well, that really is a complicated question, and it's not so much the my stance on affirmative action, it's the different kinds of issues that are lumped together under the title affirmative action. I think there's a vast difference between action deciding on who can be become a member of a student body because the diversity in the classroom is terribly important. And the same considerations do not necessarily apply to whether there must be diversity on a, on a gang of workers working on a highway or something like that. There are, di there are different problems. They overlap, but, uh, and I, I have changed to some extent, but, but not as much as the question implies. How, how, would, how would you characterize the change? How, how, would I, how would you characterize the change in your thinking on that issue? Uh, well, I've seen uh, more tangible benefits from affirmative action than I had expected to. And I think it's true that it has helped uh, the educational process particularly. But the first case that might have been, been a change is the uh, uh, Jackson against uh, Michigan case, where the question is whether a student body in Michigan would benefit by having an African-American teacher in, uh, instead of having an all-white faculty. And it seemed perfectly obvious to me that it would, but the court nevertheless felt, felt otherwise. Here's a question about one of the chiefs uh, in your book, which is uh, Chief Justice Earl Warren. He was, by all accounts, a successful Chief Justice and Governor of California. And as a consequence, the person writing the question asked that, says that some have argued recently that a politician would serve the court well uh, as a member. And you note in your book that uh, at present, everyone, I think, save one uh, of the members of the court was a federal appellate court uh, judge uh, beforehand. Do you think that it would be good to have a diversity of? Yeah, yes, I do. I, I think, I think it's, it's healthy to have diversity in a number of different uh, areas. And I, and I do think there are all sorts of qualifications for a Supreme Court uh, position that do not necessarily require experience on an appellate court. Justice O'Connor, she was had some legislative experience, Correct, I guess, when yeah. she was, and then and she'd also been a judge. She had been a judge. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Okay. So this is an interesting question. Do you think nine is the right number? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and why? Well, you need an odd number because, you, in case of ties, you have to be able to decide the case, and it's the way the court has worked for long, long time, and I'm kind of a believer in tradition and things that work okay for a long time probably should be preserved. <laughs> okay. Um, what outside of your legal training do you think most prepared you for the Supreme Court and the cases that it has faced? I don't know. I've, I've often thought it may well have been my experience in practices the most important part of my education because I was very blessed by having two very fine lawyers as partners, uh, one who was a good football player and another who was a good basketball player, oddly <laughs> enough. But uh, uh, the, the practice of the law is very, is a, a, is, is a wonderful educational experience. One learns much, much more than, 
and you, you realize if you have a general practice. Now, if you, if you specialize in some narrow specialty, I suppose that's probably not true. But uh, the law practice is a very interesting and, and, and good profession. Just to give you an example, a story that I always uh, liked about your practice was that you were a counsel to the Senate uh, on the antitrust examination to the, uh, exemption in baseball. To the House of Representatives. To the House of Representatives, okay? You were counsel to the House uh, on whether baseball should get an antitrust exemption. And in that connection, you had the occasion to uh, cross-examine Ty Cobb. Well, that's true. Actually, I, there wasn't much to the cross-examination, but I, I remember the interview much better than, than the, the pre-trial interview. But you might be interested, to, and go back, going back to those hearings, particularly because uh, Jackie Robinson is such an important person in, in the current thinking about uh, integration in, in baseball. I also had a chance to interview Branch Rickey. Oh, you did? And the most important thing I still remember of my interview with, with Mr. Rickey was he said something like, do you know what it really is required to have a successful athletic team? I said, no. He said, keep them hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and so they'll have an ambition to make more money. And I often think about that when I think about what athletes make today. I guess maybe, I don't know whether he was right or they're right or what, <laughs> but the world is certainly different in the athletic field than it is now. I don't know if that's true of the, of the Boston Red Sox or not. <laughs> <laughs> they're doing better this year, you'll be glad to know. So, uh, There's a question about uh, why you retired uh, when you did, which uh, we'd have to say you gave sufficient service, so you were entitled to retire. But how, do you, how did you come to that decision? What goes through your mind in making that judgment? Well, there, there are two factors. One, I had an understanding with my good friend David Souter before when he was on the court that uh, he, would, he would tip me off if he became convinced that I started to lose my marbles. <laughs> and uh, he agreed. But then uh, two years before, the, uh, before I started to lose my marbles, he retired. So I didn't. <laughs> you, you lost your. I, I lost my, yeah. my, uh, <laughs> my protector. So that was one major factor in the decision. And the second, in all honesty, is that uh, in my dissent, when I dissented in, this, in the Citizens of the United case, I had a little trouble articulating my oral dissent. I stumbled two or three times in my, my statement that seemed to me, this is not characteristic. Maybe you should think twice about trying to uh, continue on the job. Can you talk a little bit about oral dissents? Because I know that's something that people don't uh, appreciate as much, maybe, that they, they happen to the extent that they do. So there's the actual written opinion, and then when there's a case, I guess, that you feel very strongly about, uh, you'll also write an oral statement uh, that you'll deliver at the time the case uh, is announced. And how do you decide when you're going to do that or not? Well, you might be interested in, in the, the background of that. That was a position that Justice Harlan had explained to Justice Stewart that he thought at least one case every term should be, the dissent should be announced orally so the public would realize they were human beings and not merely working on uh, written, written uh, opinions. And so, and I remember Potter telling me that, and it's been true, every t term that I've been on the courts, at least one dissent has been announced orally. And I remember, I think I mentioned this in the book, that uh, this first or second year when Nino Scalia was on the court, at one of our parties at, a, at the end, end of the term, we had a party with the law clerks and so forth, uh, Byron uh, uh, White and I were talking about that very issue and said we, don't, we haven't had an oral dissent yet. And Nino came up and we, he joined our conversation. And we both suggested to him that he ought to announce orally his dissent in the, uh, you know the name of the case, the one involving the executive, uh, one of his, one of Morrison? His, yeah, Morrison, Morrison versus Morrison Olson. Olson. And so he did, he decided, he went ahead and announced this and he, he preserved the tradition. I'm not sure he still remembers that Byron and I suggested that he do that because <laughs> that, that dissent took on a, a life of its own and, and helped establish his, his uh, uh, reputation as a fine, a fine justice. 
So, Justice, we have one uh, time for one more question or one more? Okay. So, we, we'll see if you answer this. If you don't, I'll ask a different one. Uh, <laughs> You've worked with these uh, members of the court uh, for a while who are now on it. Uh, what do you think they will do in the Defense of Marriage Act? What do you think they should do? Well, I'll tell you what I, th well, I think both what, the, uh, what they should do and what they probably do. I think the, the attack on the constitutionality of the Defense Act is a very persuasive case because the, the impact of the tax laws is really screams out that this is pretty unjust. So I really expect them to hold that statute unconstitutional. In the other case, I just find it difficult to find standing in the part of the people who are defending uh, the California proposition. And my, my judgment would be they will dismiss that petition as having been improper, improvidently granted. I thought they would do it the week after arguing, but I'm dead wrong there, so I may well be wrong here. But my guess, if I had to make a guess, is they will dig that case and they'll hold the, uh, the federal statute un invalid. Justice Stevens, I just want to say again on behalf of uh, myself uh, as your former clerk, but on behalf of the Kennedy Library and, and all the people who came out to see you today, it's been a great uh, privilege to hear about your life and your thoughts about the law. Thank you. Thank you.